Okay, we're ready to go. Uh, Lord King, we're invoking Article 50 um, on the 29th of March. We now know the date. Do you have any fear at all about the process we're embarking upon? Well, it's bound to be a complex process. So there's my, my biggest concern is not about the challenge of Brexit as such, but about whether we're going to make the decisions early enough that would enable us to make the practical planning that is important. If we're going to leave, I think we should have a simple, clean Brexit and to minimise the scale of the negotiation. After all, in many ways, we're not leaving the European Union. The European Union is leaving us. It's a completely different institution now than the one that we joined. And I think the challenge to politicians now is to make clear the difference between Europe, the European Union, and the monetary union. The biggest countries in the EU, other than Britain, are in the monetary union and they are in the Schengen area. These are the two pro big problems they face, how to make these work, and they have no answers at present. And no politician can take Britain out of Europe. We're in Europe, we always have been, we always will be. And we actually trade more, live more, study more in Europe than ever before. It's the one in the middle, the European Union, that we have, have ambiguity about. But we've made our decision, and the most important thing now is not to get embroiled in a massive negotiation covering everything, when nothing gets resolved until the end of the two-year period. We need practical preparations to start now. Right. There is a lot of talk about what happens if we so-called don't get a deal, the no-deal option. How bad would or could the no-deal option be for the UK? I don't think it's anywhere near as bad as some people portray. I mean, clearly the campaign was very divisive, and as a result, people on either side of the issue now still exaggerate the consequences of it. So I think a clean Brexit is probably the only way in which we can proceed satisfactorily But is that a no, is that a no deal Brexit? Is that because the cleanest Brexit is one where we have no deal, we're just, we are a sovereign so, nation again, and we have no new relationship with the So EU. I think the, the way... It's the thing the car manufacturers would say they are most terrified of. But I think they're wrong to say that, because the best way for us to make progress would be to announce now that we are prepared, and this is our default position, to leave both the single market and the customs union, and we will make our plans on that basis. If we don't, then further down the road we could have a practical chaos. So we've got to prepare for that. We then have to announce an immigration policy for the UK, which nine months after the referendum we still don't have. We need these things urgently. Having got that in place, we then let the other side in Europe reflect on that for a time. Then we can say to them, well, look, do you want to have discussions about a free trade deal, say, on manufactured goods or not? Now, my guess is that they will want to do it, but it's not under our control. And I think, therefore, what we have to do is to make work the things that we can control. Do you think rationality is going to govern this process? I mean, you've seen the way negotiations work. You, in the book, you talk about how difficult it is to come to the right collective outcome in a yes. lot of these cases. So even though everyone may recognise that there's, there's a right outcome, do you not see a danger that there may actually be a wrong outcome? Well, there's a danger that we won't make progress in negotiations, at least within the two-year horizon. But what follows from that is not that we say, OK, we'll give in to everything that the other side demands is that we say these are the things that are, are under our control and we, a clean Brexit is under our control. And there will be things that we'll want to discuss, but we have to minimise the area of negotiation. And I think the government also has to point out the potential opportunities that Brexit gives. We have, for example, an opportunity to have a totally different policy on food prices. When we joined the European Union, one of the big downsides was the sharp rise in food prices. If you were looking for a policy to help low-income families, a sharp fall in food prices would be one of the best things. We could restructure the way we give subsidies to agriculture. We could, for example, in Northern Ireland, which is a problem that I think deserves more attention than it's getting at present, try and have a conversation with the government south of the border. And I know they were very nervous about the Brexit outcome. I was there just before the referendum. And say to them, can we find a way of shifting the tax and tariff border from the land frontier to the sea frontier, while not disturbing the political arrangements. I think it's in everyone's interest to have an imaginative dis discussion about where we could go. Well, you so mean there basically are basically have a customs border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. And a tax, there's no reason why the rate of corporation tax in Northern Ireland 
has to be the same as in the rest of the United Kingdom once we have the freedom to do that, having left the European well, that, Union. But that is quite a radical idea because that is bringing a great separation between the nations of the, of the UK, well, isn't it? That it not in practice, because in practice, <coughs> most of the companies in Northern Ireland are very small companies. You can certainly say to any big one that pretends to relocate to Northern Ireland, show us the factories, show us where the employees are. If there aren't very many, then small and medium-sized companies in Northern Ireland could pay the same rate of corporation taxes in the Republic. And one of the things that struck me when I was governor was how little economic activity straddled the border. Most of the trade between Northern Ireland and the small businesses there was not with their counterparts in the south, but with their counterparts on the mainland. And actually, it's in everyone's interest to rejuvenate the economy of the island, both north and south, and the banking system too. But what my point is a general one, which is there are opportunities here that require imaginative thinking. And what worries me at present is whether it's the civil service, whether it's politicians, everyone is saying, oh, it's throwing up their hands and say, we can't do this, it's all too difficult, too complicated. I don't believe that to be true, but it will require some serious leadership and a real intellectual vision of what we're trying to achieve. But keep it simple, stupid, is the kind of the KISS pro principle or whatever people call it in terms of negotiation. Don't in terms of negotiations, it. keep it simple and minimise the number of things about which we have to negotiate. You, you, you've written a bit about how the public, in a way, were voting against experts and the expert opinion when they voted, <coughs> they voted for Brexit. And you, I mean, you aren't one of those experts. You are, the, you are one of those people. What, I mean, what is your current feeling about experts? Because it's experts who are going to have to do all this imaginative thinking. Are you think, is suggesting that they're letting the country down at the moment? No, I don't think that. But I think the idea that someone says that 80% you know, of economists think this or think that, you don't get 80 different views or opinions formed independently. You're getting a consensus view from a group of people who've got one perspective on the issue. And I think that the big problem in the campaign was that experts allowed themselves to have their views misrepresented. In other words, the idea that anyone could know that we'd all be £4,300 worse, worse off if we left the European Union was absurd. No one can be that confident or that sure. There were arguments on both sides. And what economists should have done was to frame the arguments, say, well, there are arguments for, arguments against. But what happened in the referendum was that both sides said the only arguments are on this side or that side. And I think most people that I met who weren't experts or weren't taking part in the campaign were completely appalled by the fact that no one seemed to be willing to say, well, there are arguments on both sides. But for me, the decisive one, either to stay in is this argument or to leave is that argument. And we never had that kind of referendum campaign. I mean, in some ways, what you're saying could be taken as a criticism of George Osborne, who, whose treasury, under his guidance, came up with this famous figure of how much each household would lose if we, if we left the EU. It's been an interesting week for him. Do you think someone can sustain as many jobs as the guy is sustaining? Well, the only person who knows that is, is George Osborne, and he's got tremendous ability. I admire him a lot. I like him. The issue is not whether he can do the jobs. The issue is whether there are any conflicts of interest. And that's not for me to say, and I'm not going to get involved in that. Right. Um, the kind of the public rebellion that some people have said is expressed in a vote for Brexit against uh, elites and experts was also expressed in the United States, perhaps even more so, with the election of, of Donald Trump. Um, do you think Trump is the answer to the problems of the communities in particular who voted for him. I'm thinking of kind of Rust Belt communities, blue collar workers who don't feel their jobs are there anymore. Do you think Trump has any answers to those problems? Well, so far he hasn't produced any answers. I mean, the only thing we know about President Trump is that we do not know what he will do next. And I think he was right to identify the problem in his campaign, and I think that's why he won. But I don't think he's come up with solutions and I'm not sure if there are any easy ways to say to people who are working in industries for which they, you know, they had high wages in those manufacturing sectors like car workers. If people in Mexico can make cars more cheaply, at least the rest of the world is going to be buying cars from Mexico, not from the United States. So he is in no position to, to protect those jobs. What he has to do, I think, is to say to the American people, that in effect what they are going through now is what we in Britain went through in the 1970s and 1980s, which was a significant transformation of our industrial structure. 
we now have a large number of very effective, efficient and successful niche manufacturers, engineering and other products. The large scale mass production we don't really do anymore. That was inevitable. And the US has to go through the same transformation. So what he has to offer is the opportunities to acquire skills, to improve the educational system. That's got to be the method by which success will come. But it's not going to happen by the time of the next presidential election. And it's not going to happen, I would assume, you would think, as a trained in basically standard economics, it's not going to happen through restricting trade with Mexico or with China or anybody, presumably. I don't think that's going to be terribly successful. And what is interesting is that so far the statements he's made have simply had the effect of pushing the US dollar up and the Mexican peso down, which has actually made Mexico even more competitive than it was before. And so I, I, I think there is a big challenge. Customarily, the, uh, the G20, and you've been to G20 meetings in your time as central bank uh -huh. governor, will always, as a sort of ritual, say, we'll resist all forces of protection. It didn't say that at the latest meeting in the last few days. Presumably in deference, well, we know in deference yes. to the opinion of the United States. Would you have preferred the G20 to say we will oppose protection in all its forms? Frankly, I don't think their communiques are worth very much at all. I mean, last year they said Brexit was the biggest financial risk facing the world, or one of them. That was done in deference to George Osborne, not because they really believed it. This year they've changed the wording in deference to the new US Treasury Secretary to give him time to get his feet under the desk, not because they really believe it. Frankly, I don't think those communiques are worded very well. What does matter is that the IMF as an institution starts to try to build confidence and trust among nations because the biggest challenge we face now is that the whole world economy needs rebalancing to a significant extent. China needs to rely less on exports and rely more on production for domestic spending. We in the United States need to move in the opposite direction. No one has any incentive to be the first mover. We need to move together and that will only happen with trust. The IMF can build that up as I describe in my book, but it requires not communiques, not people shaking hands in front of TV cameras, but genuine building of trust and confidence behind the scenes. I'll get on to the state of the world economy. Just one specific one on trade, because a lot has been said about the potential for a UK-US trade deal uh, of some kind. Would such a deal benefit the UK's trade balance or the US trade balance? Because my slight feeling is that both sides are thinking, we'll sign all these deals, we'll suddenly be exporting more and bring our country into better balance. But both of us have the same problem, and I'm not sure which one of us would benefit. So I'm not sure if it matters what happens to the bilateral trade balance. What happens is the, what matters to the overall trade balance. And of course, one of the advantages the UK does have in negotiating a trade deal with the EU is that key parts of the European economy, particularly the German automobile sector, you know, is desperately keen to retain tariff-free access to the UK market. We in the UK need to do something about our trade deficit. It's, it's almost 6% of GDP. This is a massive figure. And my biggest worry about economic policy in the next few years is that all the politicians seem obsessed with Brexit. And actually the biggest problems we face now are not Brexit. It's about how we can reduce the trade balance, trade deficit, how we're going to save enough as a nation to pay for our pensions, because the pension scheme has deteriorated uh, over the last 25 years. How are we going to save enough to pay for care for the elderly when we will become so old that we need that support? How are we going to finance the NHS? These are the big economic challenges. And if politicians ignore those and focus only on Brexit for the next two, three years, then I think those big questions will not receive the attention which they deserve. And you think they might be giving too little weight to those while they, their mind is off elsewhere? Well, it's clear that their mind is now completely on Brexit, and I think that's unfortunate. The global economy is in a very funny place still, isn't it? It is. You, you think that central banks do not have the power to get us out of this mess? Correct. And instead, how do you characterise it? Is it sort of almost like they're trying to give us the same drugs and these drugs have, have worn out now and we just need to move on to a completely different treatment? So I think when the financial crisis reached its peak in 2008, what was so striking was that in the following six months, world trade collapsed faster than in the Great Depression. There was a, a, a big recession around the industrialized world. That required a painkiller 
and the painkiller was both fiscal stimulus but also monetary stimulus and it worked and the pain was relieved. Unemployment did not rise as far and as fast as it did in the Great Depression. But just as when a doctor sees a patient who's ill and suffering and gives them a painkiller, he doesn't normally say, well, here's a few more painkillers, I'm off. He stays around and actually diagnoses the fundamental problem. And that's what's not happened. In the obsession with the consequences of the financial crisis, people are focused only on changing the way regulation of banks operates. Actually, the structure of not just our economy, but most economies around the world needs to change. And we've got ourselves stuck into a position where we've got absurdly low interest rates. Many exchange rates are at totally the wrong levels. I mean, Germany has a trade surplus now of 9% of GDP and counting. They have a vastly undervalued exchange rate. Uh, so we, have, we had, until the Brexit referendum, an overvalued exchange rate. There are many countries in the south of Europe which have overvalued exchange rates. Until we can sort these things out, then I think we're going to find it very hard to move towards a better balance in the world economy. Have you got a solution? So I think the solution I have, and it's not a very compelling one, I accept, is that first of all central banks say, look, we can only provide painkillers, so don't look to us as the answer. I mean, the great attraction of Mr. Trump in America is that he's got the Federal Reserve off the hook. He said, I will take responsibility for the health of the US economy, not the Federal Reserve. And he's announced measures which meant that markets expect interest rates to rise so that when the Federal Reserve, as it did last week, raises rates, there isn't a great surprise, there isn't a great market disturbance. So I think central banks need to get themselves into that position. And then governments need, together, collectively, to find a way in which they accept that they must accept changes in exchange rates, put in place measures which will restructure the supply side of their economies, enabling in the UK for us to move more towards exports and investment and less towards consumer spending, and the opposite in countries like China and Germany. Now, I think the biggest stumbling block here is the operation of the monetary union in Europe. And that's not going to be unpicked in any... It's very yeah, unlikely that the existing politicians will try to unpick it, but of course new parties will arise and whether people are prepared to tolerate very low growth and high unemployment indefinitely remains to be seen. Mm. What about the banking system? I mean, Donald Trump, one of the things he has said he wants to do is revise Dodd-Frank, <coughs> the big post-crisis regulatory change in the US. He thinks it's getting in the way. He wants a more deregulated environment. Uh, a, is that the right approach and B, are you worried about the fragility of the global banking system still, which is a sort of two years on since you wrote the first edition of your book? So I think that there is an argument which can be made to support part of the move that President Trump wants to make, which is we've made the regulatory system incredibly complex. People who work in banks have to go to their compliance officer before they can do anything. What regulators have done is to produce literally tens of thousands of pages of regulations and say, well, you must obey each of these. And they've done it in order to prevent a repetition of what happened before. But of course, the next financial crisis that comes along won't look quite like the one that happened before. And what we need is something much simpler. So I would say there's a, there should be a deal on the table here. We say to the financial sector, look, we will get rid of a lot of the detail that you're facing at present. But in return for that, you've got to be willing to have perhaps even more equity finance on your balance sheet than at present. And you've got to be willing to take out the insurance that I describe in my book, which means that people would believe that if a bank experienced a run on its deposits or its other short-term financing, that they would have the ability to go to the central bank and immediately be able to get money to pay them off. And in that situation, we could say that the banks have had to pay for insurance for years beforehand. I think it would not only remove the risk of bank runs, but actually solve the political problem of people justifiably saying, well, ha hang on, banks went, got into serious trouble. Why are they being bailed out? And what we need is an insurance policy under which they pay the premium first for many years, and then they're entitled to call on that policy to borrow from the central bank when there's a crisis. Once that every 100 years, they come in and claim the help from the central bank. Exactly. And they paid their insurance. Absolutely. Are you scared of any banks having a run on them in the next couple of years? Well, not in the UK or the US, no. But I think that elsewhere in the world, there are, have to be concerns about the banking system. In Europe, the banking system is still fragile. 
We've seen concerns about the financial sector in China. There are other parts of the world. And I think the thing that uh, everyone needs to be concerned about is if you get a serious problem in the banking sector in one part of the world, it can quite easily lead to problems in the banking system elsewhere. So our banks are in good shape. But if there were a serious problem on the continent in Europe, then there would be a blowback to our banking system as well. I just want to briefly talk about Scotland, which you mention in your, your book. You say it would have been perfectly viable as a nation at the time of the last referendum. Project fear perhaps was overdone at the time of the last yes. referendum. The oil price is much lower now. The, the revenue Scotland would derive from oil is much lower. Do you still think Scotland would be viable as a nation? Well, of course, Scotland certainly could be an independent country. There are plenty of small countries the same size as Scotland. Scotland has both the people, it has the capital city, the history, the culture. It could be an independent country. The question is, does it want to be, given the consequences of it? Now, I myself don't think there are any major problems in terms of currency. That was the thing that Project Fear focused on last time. But there is an issue about public finances. And if the oil price remains low, and if they lose the money which is transferred from the rest of the United Kingdom to Scotland, then they would have to make that up in their own budget. But that's a consequence of deciding to be financially independent. You end up paying for yourself. And it would be a challenge, I think, to borrow on the international market if Scotland decided to run a large budget deficit. I think that would be expensive. The interest rate would go up. But that's one of the consequences of saying, look, if we want to be independent, we have to accept the consequences. So you're, in a way, it's good news and bad news for the SNP, if you like. Good news, perfectly viable. Bad news, there may well be an economic cost that you'd have to bear. And I think it's a grown-up way of debating it. Anyone yeah. who says that Scotland can't be independent, this is an, an absurd argument. Of course Scotland can be independent. I personally would be deeply sad if Scotland voted to be an independent country because I think as an Englishman that I think the United Kingdom as a whole, of which we're a key part, has benefited from the presence of Scotland. So I think I'd be sad to, to, if Scotland but were to leave. And I like, I li I'd like to think that Scotland would reflect on whether it too might lose something by no longer being part of this bigger entity. Your solution for the Scottish currency question is that it just uses sterling, yes. not as part of some official deal with England or the rest of the UK, but just it just says we're going to use your currency. I mean, why shouldn't we? Yes. Um, the only problem with that is that if it needed to sort out its banks by, for example, getting help from the central bank, it wouldn't have its own central bank to help its banks, or RBS in particular. What is the solution to Scotland's banking, huge banking sector, if it, if it just borrows a currency from another country? Well, it, the banks it's got now are essentially, in essence, UK banks, even if in some cases the uh, gold plate for the head office is in Edinburgh. But actually, that would have to move to London. But there's no reason why the banks any of the British banks which operate branches in Scotland would want to change what they're doing. They make money out of the business now, they will carry on making money out of it. So I don't think but it's head a head offices in change. London is the cost of that particular Yes, it is. Yeah. But I don't think where the, I mean, the people don't have to move. You know, I mean, the, the brass plate has the to move. The brass plate moves, but actually uh, the, where the mind and matter are doesn't change in any sense. Most of it is in London now anyway. So I don't think that's a big question. I think the problem for those who want to argue for independence is that in terms of this monetary solution, it certainly removes, in my view, the argument against independence, but it does so at the cost of making absolutely clear that Scotland would have no independent say over monetary policy. It would have to just accept the monetary policy that was coming out of the Bank of England in London, and it would accept the supervision of the Bank of England. Now, that may be, that's why I think in the last referendum, neither side were prepared to confront this objectively. Uh, the U Westminster government didn't want to admit that there was a solution to the currency problem because they wanted to run the argument of Project Fear. And the Scottish nationalists were very nervous about saying, but actually we'd no longer even have a Scottish nationalist member of parliament sitting on the Treasury Committee grilling the governor. We would simply take the monetary policy which England decided was right for itself. In some ways, you're coming across as optimistic, particularly on Brexit and, uh, and, and, and to some degree, President Trump and what he stands for. <coughs> in some ways, you're pessimistic because you've outlined quite a number of problems that still exist in the world economy that existed when you were governor of the Bank of England yes. all those years ago. And, uh, Only three years, then. Well, well, you know, but they, they existed at the beginning of your time as governor, <laughs> yes. let alone right at the end. What, 
where do you invest your money now? I mean, a lot of people looking at the world sort of think this is a very confusing time. What do you do with money? Where do you park it? Well, I don't have enough to invest it in that way, I'm afraid, Evan. So I don't, I don't think people should think about it in those terms. I think what I'm concerned about is that we get to an economic policy which enables central banks around the world to feel that it's sensible to raise interest rates. To my mind, the single most important symptom of what went wrong was over 25 years a gradual fall in interest rates till we ended up with zero. And each country that made those moves was doing the right thing in terms of its own interests at the time. But collectively, it's got us into a very bad place. So and you what, can't just whack well, them up. I mean, and there's no point, just, no point no. just raising rates and doing nothing else. So what we need is to, I think, find a way of making more flexible the exchange rate system that we're using. We've got to put in place a wave of supply side reforms to make people more optimistic about their incomes in the future. And we've got to have, I think, some kind of mechanism for ensuring informal cooperation, if necessary, just behind the scenes, to give confidence to countries that if, for example, China really does at last start to wind down the export sector and move into the sector producing for domestic spending, they will know that if they do it, then the US and the UK will be moving in the opposite direction. And we can all benefit from that. But these are the big problems. And Brexit does not come into that category. Lord King, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.